world is comprised of nearly 50% women. Sadly, you'd never know it by looking at the top leadership roles in business. The numbers are dismal. According to the International Labor Organization, only three out of 108 countries studied have achieved gender equality in their management ranks. And those three countries? Wait for it. Jamaica, Colombia, and Santa Lucia. In case you were wondering, the world's largest economies don't even rank in the top 10 when it comes to women in leadership roles. Our next guest, Susan Colantuno, wants to change that. She's an internationally known leadership expert, author, and founder and CEO of Leading Women. That's a consulting firm that works with companies worldwide by supporting corporate initiatives to advance women and close the leadership gender gap. Susan, we want to welcome you to Full Frame. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you, Mike. How do you define leadership? Oh, that's such a pivotal question because if anyone, woman or man, wants to be effective and build a great career, they have to realize that the foundation of career success is their proven and perceived leadership skills. So I knew that I needed a definition of leadership. I couldn't find one in the literature. So I created one, which has been the foundation of the work that we do. And the definition that I use is that leadership is using the greatness in you to achieve and sustain extraordinary outcomes by engaging the greatness in others. Uh, this definition resonates very much with people who work in business organizations, but it applies anywhere. It's totally not gender um, biased, it's totally gender neutral, and it relates to wherever you are in an organization. You can be an individual contributor or a CEO, and this definition still applies. But you know what's interesting is there is a gender bias, and, and you did some digging, and you talk a lot about the huh. missing 33%. Can you tell us about that? What is that? And why is it missing for women? It is not so when it comes to men in many cases. Okay, so the definition that I just shared with you has three parts, using personal greatness, engaging the greatness in others, and achieving and sustaining extraordinary outcomes. Our research over 14 years now has, it, we're doing a survey of surveys, and what we've discovered is that when managers rate the performance of women and men. There's this consistent pattern where managers expect men to outperform women on that third of the definition that has to do with achieving outcomes. Basically, the competencies there are business, strategic, and financial acumen. So it's missing in managers' expectations that women will be good at the business of the business, at understanding the financials, and at being strategic. So it's missing in managers' expectations of women, and it's also missing in the advice that women tend to get, both formally and informally. It, it's not that it's missing in women. That, Women, of course, can have business strategic and financial acumen. Some may not, but the missing 33% speaks more to its being missing in the mindsets of managers and in the body of advice that's given women about how to advance in our careers. Let me ask you about shared traits that you see. I mean, it's a very limited pool of women uh, CEOs. What are some of the shared traits you see in them? Well, all of the women CEOs fit the definition of leadership. So that's, that's the one thing they all have in common. Uh, aside from that, there are some similar experiences that they share. Nearly all of them have run a business, a business unit within the corporation that they um, are leading. Most of them have grown up in the business that they have become CEO of, but not all. If they haven't run a business unit or started, a bus started up a business unit in uh, the business that they're leading, they had other uh, jobs that gave them that big strategic picture and an understanding of the finance finances of the business. So they may have worked in a merger and acquisition function. What's very interesting and what many people don't know is that nearly all of the Fortune 500 women CEOs and many of the women CEOs in other countries have children. Often they have two or more. So this myth about you can't have it all and uh, it, 
children being a barrier to career advancement is just that. It's a myth. But, but it's still, that's still an issue out there uh, that, that women have to deal with that men don't. I mean, I, I was just speaking to a gentleman recently who'd done studies on this, and he said, you know, Norway is all about providing childcare, a lot more progressive, a uh, lot more, uh, I guess, endearing towards women. Whereas a, a culture like Japan, uh, you got to get in there with the guys and you got to work the 80 hours and we don't care if you've got kids. There's still, that's still an issue for women though, isn't it? It's a significant challenge for women, depending as you're saying, Mike, on the countries where they're working. So in, this, in the Nordic countries, Iceland, uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, the social support for pa working parents is much stronger than it is in many other countries, including here in the U.S. So we more or less have to figure it out ourselves. Many companies don't provide uh, maternity, paid maternity leave. Many men don't feel comfortable taking paternity leave. So I'm not saying that it's necessarily easy. I'm saying that it's absolutely possible to figure out. Be and I say this not only because most of the Fortune 500 we women CEOs have children, often two or more, but for many of them, their husbands aren't house husbands. There's this myth out there that if you're going to be a successful career-oriented woman, your husband has to take a back seat, and that's just not true. Many of their husbands have their own uh, significant and important careers. We're just about out of time, but I've got to talk to you a little bit about the impact of uh, your talking about this issue, because I know it's really taken off like a, like a firestorm in many respects. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the things you've heard, not just from the executive saying, oh, wow, I can't believe this, but just women who come up must come up to you and say thank you for talking about this and pointing us in the right direction? Yeah, I've been inundated and very, um, very honored by the heartfelt thanks that have come from women and men all around the world. The one story that I'd love to share with you just came in the last week, and it was a young woman who heard the TED Talk about three months ago and took some time to figure out what she wanted to do about it. She set an appointment to meet with her general manager. He, did, he had no idea what the meeting was about, and she said in the meeting, I want to understand how you do your job. So in that meeting, he sat down with her and talked over the P&L report, how he prepares it, how it's presented to the executive team at the company, uh, what stories it tells, how he interacts with those stories, and invited her to shadow him in attending one of the executive team meetings. She left that meeting feel like she, feeling as if she had an entirely new perspective on the business. The whole conversation was filling in the missing 33%. And also she believed that her, her, man, her general manager had a deeper understanding of her interest in her career and her commitment to being a contributor in the business. So that just uh, filled me with joy when I read that. Well, it certainly should. Susan Colantuno, thank you so much for talking to us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. I enjoyed it.